Hello, um, I'm James Patterson and delighted to be here again with my good friend and colleague Martin Robinson. Martin, how are you? Yeah, very well, James. Nice to see you again. You too. And we said uh, in our discussions that it would be interesting to talk about the governance topic. And this is a briefing for internal auditors. So uh, I'm looking forward to talking this through uh, with you, Martin. Indeed, and me as well. I'll start off. What is governance? Now, you can look this up and this will vary from country to country. But the basic gist is a set of rules and practices and processes that determine how an organisation should be run. It sorts out who's accountable to make what decisions. And the idea is relevant people in the organisation. Martin will talk more about this in a minute will be considered, whether that's customers or whatever. The main challenges that governance is intended to address are basically that we have the right direction or strategy for our organisation and we know what objectives we're aiming for, that we're able to uh, measure how the organisation is doing. And then if there are other things that we need to do, uh, maybe outsourcing something, that we do that uh, in a good way. And one of the key things uh, that we should always bear in mind with governance is there's a basic level, Martin will talk us through that in a little bit, which is basically, do you tick the box? But then there's also a much more important level, which is, is the decisions that are being made optimizing how the organization is doing in the short term, but obviously, in the long term as well. And when I say optimizing, I don't just mean the basic business results. I mean, viewing the performance of the organization in a more rounded, holistic way. Martin, any further reflections on that? No, I think that's very useful. I think the only thing I'd like to add, James, is the whole idea of governance is a very complex area. And it's very rare that in an organization where someone is directly responsible for governance. So governance is something that spans different parts of an organization and I think that's that's quite hard for, for people to actually focus on some of the key issues really so um, in my experience it's one of the most complex areas to look at in any sort of organization to be honest James. but I concur with some of the issues you just raised. Exactly and you've just highlighted Martin why we thought this would be a good topic for internal auditors it is one of the areas where auditors uh, can have difficulties and challenges and get into trouble. Martin, over to you. Yeah, thanks, John. So if we look at the stakeholders when we look at governance, and obviously it depends on the, the sort of organisation uh, you work in or, or, you're, or you're looking at. Uh, but if we look like some of some of the stakeholders we're talking about here, um, obviously the shareholders, if it's that sort of company, um, but obviously employees, uh, customers, the legal and regulatory structure, which James just alluded to, uh, and not forgetting the external societal and environmental issues as well which are really important and really for the sake of this little discussion today we're really focusing on the sort of slightly larger organizations and although obviously even if it's a very very small business governance is important really i think james we're focusing today on more sort of a, an organizational size of about 200 staff or something like that uh, but some of the issues we're talking about would also be relevant i think to um a very small organization or a very small charity if you like uh, but probably we're focusing a bit more on the sort of our slightly larger organizations today aren't we James but, but but the factors we're talking about will be relevant for all and things we should have a look at on um, whatever the size of the organization or indeed the sector and what you've highlighted by showing us this diagram Martin is you can be brilliant on making money but if you can't actually uh, get make your customers loyal and understand what they want, if you can't deal with the um, perceptions of stakeholders, and you'll take us through some examples later of companies that and organisations that have got into trouble, at some point you'll get into difficulty. So we want to emphasise, don't we? But governance is about getting this balanced performance for an organisation 
not simply making money and complying with the law, and that's the end of it. That's exactly right. I think that's right. So some of these are very much softer issues as well, which are much more harder to look at as well. To be honest. Brilliant. Uh, we're going to build from uh, kind of basic governance uh, all the way through to more advanced. Uh, and Martin's going to start us off with just some of the basics. OK, thanks, James. So what I'm going to take us through now is some of the steps we should be talking about, of the basic things we should be doing, really, in, in any sort of organisation. Um, so if we look about sort of selection of, of staff and people and the way we approach recruitment, Obviously, it's got to comply with all legal processes to make sure we do the right thing in the right way, which obviously is relatively straightforward. A bit more tricky, really, is deciding what roles you need, but also deciding the responsibilities, the authority levels, the spans of control, division of responsibilities, etc. The most fundamental in that section as well is how does decision making work? what makes decision making effective and that's both sort of uh, top down and down up how does that work in practice how does that fit together is it coherent is it logical do people understand it and that is quite a big area i think when we're looking at governments to make sure that actually works right and even from the point of view of making sure your organization chart your organization is chart structure is clear and unambiguous and understood by everyone. Um, from the point of view of strategy and objectives, um, are these clear? Are they established at the top? Is there clear communication? Do people all the way down the organization understand what the business is trying to do? But also there's a feedback that people actually understand what the main objectives of the business are, what they're trying to do, what does success look like? Um, then moving on to, if you like, our comfort zone as auditors, what about this whole area of risk and control, making sure the checks and balances are in place? And again, it's both upwards and downwards, because when risks and control mechanisms are established by more senior people, there's an expectation that people actually comply with these things. But more importantly, if people aren't complying, there are mechan mechanisms in place, including internal audit, to feed back where these things aren't working. And then there's the whole evaluation process uh, to make sure that any threats to achieving the objectives and strategies are identified. And there's, there's a downward process and indeed an upward process, which I think, James, you might want to comment on as well. Yeah, so two, two comments. The reason that we've drawn Martin and I two arrows going down and two arrows going up from the top of the organisation to the bottom is to emphasize that there's a, this is where we're going and these are our objectives, arrow downwards. And then there's an arrow upwards saying, well, this is how we're doing against those objectives. But there's also this business about, you know, standards and requirements that needs to be communicated downwards. And then again, how are we doing against those uh, requirements? Are processes working according to plan? Hence, two arrows down, two arrows up. And then the final thing I just wanted to add, and you know, board members will know this, but certainly we're aiming this particularly for internal auditors, is I can't stress enough, and Martin and I both got experience of this, is of course you want a strategy to be aligned. So you can see on the left there, all the arrows pointing in the right direction. But you know, it'd be very easy for an auditor to say, oh, we've discovered that this other department isn't doing quite what the strategy says. But you do have to be a bit realistic. And so I've got to the right, a couple of arrows going in slightly different direction. Because if you don't allow a certain amount of wiggle room or flexibility, you'll kill all innovation and creativity in your organization. So again, I think there's just a key message in the real world of course, we need a strategy going in the right direction. But as auditors, we've got to be careful that we're not overly idealistic and controlling in the way that will be done. OK, building on what Martin said, I want to say a few things about kind of the next level up of maturity. And we've decided to call this the kind of established level. 
And, you know, as Martin said, selection and decision making that actually applies across a whole organization. But I guess when Martin and I are talking about governance, we're particularly talking about how does it operate at the very top level? And also, how does the framework for these things cascade uh, downwards? And that means inevitably, as organizations become more mature, that we would expect more uh, rigorous processes to determine how good people are. Um, so in other words, you get things like case studies that people have to do to show that they can actually do uh, the jobs that they're supposed to do. And, you know, Martin's talked about a clear organization chart. You know, again, as you get more sophisticated, you'll end up with things like accountability diagrams. RACI is one of the famous frameworks where we look at the complicated aspects of an organization and we say, well, how exactly at an operational level does do we do this and that that department do that? And at a top down, good governance will not be just asking a simplistic question. Does everybody know what they have to do? It will be saying things like, is there a clear accountability map or process diagram for the responsibilities? Building on the issue of objective setting, and it's surprising sometimes uh, how you can see this meeting, uh, missing, the, the clear gold standard or basic standard for objectives is this smart framework, specific, measurable, uh, realistic, timed uh, framework. And I would always be saying, you know, you haven't got to an established level if you haven't started to become more smart in the way uh, that you set uh, objectives. Also, when it comes to setting strategies, if you're a more basic situation, you may see a good opportunity and go for it. You'll see slightly more reflection about, well, where are we good? Where are we less good? This SWOT analysis, as you see a more mature organization in governance terms. So again, these would be exhibits you might be looking to see to give you signs that the organization is better. And then a little, um, and of course, the things I've just talked about, SMART, for example, will make evaluation of how we're doing more rigorous because you'll be able to have clearer uh, way of assessing whether something's done what they should have done, either in performance terms or in risk terms. But the final thing I wanted to say before Martin comments on this kind of established level of maturity is it's really important as you become more uh, sophisticated to see an organization which is able to calibrate its attitude to certain uh, risks. And the, and the phrase that people will be familiar with is, is risk appetite. And to me, risk appetite doesn't mean anything unless you start saying things like, so are we OK if this project is a month late? Or would it be OK if this project spent more than £50,000 over budget? To me, when you start talking about increasing maturity, the ability of the organisation to be honest about what would be acceptable in terms of its risk uh, tolerances is a really uh, you know, growing sign of a better um, organisation and, and better governance. Martin, any thoughts there? No, as you were talking, James, what I was thinking is this is when an organisation really is starting to motor, really, and actually starts to be successful. And as you are talking, James, I was thinking that really there's a complete direct link between these attributes of good governance and actually a successful business. And, and yet you don't see this written about too much. So a successful business is something because they're selling the right product in the right place or they've, they've got a good management team. But actually... What you just talked about are the success factors for any sort of business to actually achieve. And in my experience, in many ways, you you can't have a successful business without these sort of things in place. So I think it's more than good governance. It's uh, direct links between good governance and, and business success, I think. And I mean business with a small b. So in other words, it could be a charity or not-for-profit or, or Quango or whatever. It's all exactly the same. And, um, and, and this slide, I think, is... Um, really a really key one for our discussion this morning. 
I think what you've done in, in your reflection is really shift this and up the question. You know, often when you're talking about organizations, you talk about great leaders and the right culture and good people. What you've highlighted, I haven't fully appreciated it myself, this is not scripted, uh, is the idea that actually having that clear process diagram, having those smart targets, having that clear risk appetite, although they're slightly boring, they almost seem like, well, they're just about bits of paper. If those bits of paper are lived, they are actually just as important ingredients to helping you be successful as the more soft stuff, because this gives people guide rails in how they're going to operate. I think so. I agree with you. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. So um, if we think then about uh, leading good governance, you know, this is things like, and I actually used to work in HR, you know, is the organization able to spot the talent it needs for the future? And, you know, if it's big enough to actually grow its own talent, is it diverse, not simply in terms of uh, ethnic origin and gender, but also in the widest sense in terms of the way people think? Um, you know, people with different personality types, how open is the organization uh, to that? And then we, when we get into strategy and decision making, this is an, uh, an extract of the McKinsey 7S model. You start to get into how does the organization more rigorously translate strategy with organizational elements and we have here you know the processes the systems the skills the values that will deliver the strategy okay and the more advanced you are the more that you will see you know as the strategy is changing we're now thinking about what bits in the organization need to change uh, to uh, to cope with that and it won't simply be we need to get a few more people it will be things like we need to be more agile or we need to outsource this now and there'll be more organizational questions uh, that will arise as Martin said, and we hope this is useful for auditors, but also for others, you know, because this is auditors, you know, an auditor in a less established or less mature governance environment will often be rolling up their sleeves and doing all sorts of things. But the true meaning of internal audit in the way that Martin and I would see in more leading organisations is this famous three lines model, which basically says you've got managers who do things, you've got specialist functions like purchasing and finance that do things, set the frameworks, and then you've got this special independent and objective uh, audit and advisory service, which is internal audit, that basically checks that everything is working the way that we think it is. And certainly, you would expect this phrase of the three lines to be much more well understood and well embedded uh, in a more uh, leading organisation from a, from a governance point of view. And then a final couple of comments. You know, one of the most important things I think that we both like to communicate is, does the organisation see risk management and control as a kind of burden and a bureaucracy? Or does uh, the organization and the leadership in it see risk management and, and processes and policies as tools to stay, as one of my uh, good colleagues said, to stay in control? Control isn't a bad thing. It's like being a racing driver. We have these brakes so that we can take the corners really quickly. And I think this feeling of does this feel like an organization that cares about being in control, even if this means it knows that things are not going as well as they could be, that starts to become the gold level, the leading level of corporate governance. And then the final thing, and this is unusual, but it is worth highlighting it, is when you're talking about really rigorous and effective evaluation and improvement 
of the way an organization operates. You'll even seeing it being able to look at, for example, staffing levels. This is an example from the UK National Health Service. And the organization will be able to say, actually, we're running that part of the organization too hot. We need to give them some help. We need to um, you know, start to be better at our prioritization in that level, because actually things won't get done properly if they're stretched as much as they are. And that takes truly mature leadership, good processes, et cetera, so that an organization is capable to talk about things like that, as well as not be defensive when it comes to internal audit reports and so on. Martin, any other reflections on the, the leading side of things? No, I think the reflection really, again, as you were talking, is that um, this is really a team thing. It's not going to be just one person who's led all these things. And if you look at the sort of people that could lead by developing these things in each, each of these steps, you need a total team approach to this. And that's what crossed my mind as you were talking. There's, no, there's not one champion, if you like. There's five or six champions who actually talk to each other, communicate, and develop something which is truly integrated. And I think that would be my main observation. You know, you can be the best leader in the world, but actually getting all this to work needs a lot of expertise and understanding. And um, and I think that's the only thing I'd really add to that, is that um, this is a team effort. Really. You've, you've highlighted, I think, a great point. Uh, I think it was uh, Abraham Lincoln or whatever who talked about the challenge uh, cabinet or whatever and it's this idea that a really great CEO will be okay with a really great and challenging finance director, HR director, legal director and so on and so Martin's right when you think about these areas this will not be one CEO on their own there will be a series of really capable people who know what good practice really is and therefore will know where the organization is now and they'll have a view and, and be fighting for taking the organization to the next level uh, in order to support the, the success of the organization in the long run. So, Great, so that's the, that's the ideal world that we want auditors to be thinking about. And I'll come back to the basic established and leading uh, maturity levels in a minute, but Martin, Take us back down to earth, please, for a minute. Okay. So James and I are talking. This is now February 2021. So in preparation for our chat this morning, I've been reading various things about some of the things that I've been reading in the UK. And there's examples of where organisations haven't done too well because of problems with governments. And just picking a couple of ones I've been reading about in the last week or so. Um, first of all, Carillion, which is a, a major... Um, a provider of services to um, the public sector in the UK, which had a series of problems, and they actually, I think, closed down about 18 months ago. And really, evidence of where, um, in many ways, governance failed. Also, um, a major clothing retailer called Boohoo, um, which these things got so bad, they actually commissioned an external governance review, which has now been undertaken. And the final one of the few examples I've got is um, something very different. different. In the uh, Team GB gymnastics team, there's been a lot of revelations in the last couple of years about failures of governments at the senior level and the way some of the young gymnasts have been treated. So the more one looks at things that are happening in both the UK and around the world, um, things go wrong with governments, which I think could often lead to, to corporate collapse and even corporate failure. So, you know, that's really looking now a bit at the negatives and what, what could go, go wrong. and um, what what we've identified is some some attributes where things uh, could in fact go wrong. So what we've listed here is um, is, is four uh, initial potential ones, and, and possibly the first one is the most important because um, if you've got a dominant or overbearing CEO, that could affect uh, the resilience, the culture, the behaviour of everything happens um, below he or she. Um, the other one I want to pick on there is the sort of decision-making processes, which are the most difficult actually to look at in detail. Um, but that actually can lead to real problems down the line if people aren't quite clear on how decisions are made and communicated. And um, 
And then we look at sort of overall transparency and openness, which is very much linked to a sort of ethics and culture and the way we do things around here. Um, but also as auditors, we, we must understand the clear focus on risk and control as, as part of normal business. And that applies uh, to whichever organization you, you happen to work in. So these are some of the things I think that we'll be worried about if things are going wrong. But these are things that are very difficult to look at from an audit point of view. And you need to sort of uh, drill beneath the surface, really, and make sure you're talking to and discussing things with, with people at all levels in the organization, including very senior people. And that's why this whole area can be quite challenging, I think, James. I don't know whether you'd like to um, add to that at all. I think what's really good about what you've said, you know, uh, things that have gone wrong, uh, collapses, uh, things that have made, you know, in, intended an inquiry is it's very easy. I was thinking actually of Grenfell Tower, where we start worrying about how the firemen were doing. And now the debate is ranging to uh, the whole issue of the cladding. But what you're highlighting is if you start thinking about the root causes of why things go wrong, you will often find that these top level issues uh, we would say cast a very long shadow on the organization and its performance. So what seems like quite a subtle crack in the fuselage at the top level can turn out to be a much bigger physio when you're actually up at 35,000 feet and flying and in engaged in the real world. And I think this is why these things matter. And one of the things I love about the fact that you've chosen this, Martin, as a, as a topic to kind of highlight to auditors, but we all know it as well, is any one of these things, as I think you've said, will take you right back to zero. You could have an organisation that theoretically in paperwork terms has got fabulous corporate governance, but all you need is that crazy senior executive who says, come on, make an exception for me. And all of that good risk management and control is for the birds. Oh, I agree. I agree. And, and governance isn't a box ticking thing. And so often you see that, oh, yes, we've met governance requirements because we've got a policy, it's been communicated, we've got this committee, et cetera, et cetera. But it's so much more than box ticking. And I think that's, that's the issue with this whole subject. One needs, I say, drill beneath it and actually understand the mechanics. I agree with you, James. Brilliant. Well, what you've said kind of leads in nicely to, um, you know, if internal audit has been asked to look at corporate governance issues, what sorts of things uh, would we recommend? And Martin will, will build on this uh, once I've kind of walked you through a few things. I think the first thing that's worth saying, and therefore there's a connection between what we've just said and what we're saying now in terms of how would you look at stuff as an audit team, is you've got to be clear what is a realistic level of maturity that you are going to judge the governance of the organization that you've got by? You know, there is absolutely no point, and Martin chose a charity example, of looking at a charity that's two years old, that's just getting going, and saying to them, why do you not have world-class governance? Okay, the answer will be, we're working on it, you know, we're bedding down, etc. So this idea of is the target governance here basic, established or leading? And maybe there would be some areas where the need to be more established and leading will be more important. You know, if you're working in financial services, you will need to get to really great risk management and the three lines of defence much, much quicker than if you're working in some other uh, sector. So that would be the first thing that we would say is, what is the level of maturity that we're aiming for? And of course, this does need to be expressed in very clear, practical terms rather than just waving our arms. And then in this situation of corporate governance, somebody said, oh, can you look at the governance? I would always be saying, if an audit committee member said to me, can you look at the governance? I'd always be saying, well, what, what actually, what question do you want us to look at? Because you can see here, from the, the list that Martin event initially took us through. There's the selection, there's the decision-making, there's the strategy. I mean, there's a lot of aspects to governance. So one thing I would strongly recommend is focused analysis 
of specific areas until you really gain a competence in this and not just saying we'll look at all five of these straight away. I think that is a recipe for overstretching and diluting uh, the impact of uh, the internal audit work. And Martin works in this field and, and has good uh, links with, uh, is it ISACA? I can't remember what the correct name is, you'll correct me. But one thing that you have to emphasize is if you are working in corporate governance, I would always be saying as a starting point, well, okay, you know, what is it that, that doesn't seem to be working as good as it could be at the moment? Well, I'm not sure that we're really having as open conversations in the board as we should be, okay? I'm worried uh, that we may not be living up to the spirit of GDPR or this legislation. And then I would be saying, well, you know, is there a board evaluation which uh, has some information on openness in the board? Does the company secretary have a view on whether we've got any legal issues? And what I wouldn't do is just dive in to a topic without really talking it around with some of the senior executives who are involved in the board process to check that we already know uh, what's going on and we already have the importance, uh, the input of important other people. And the other thing I'd be saying, and this is why partnering with somebody who's experienced in this area, like the company secretary could be important, is, well, okay, so I find that a document hasn't been signed, or I find that, you know, a policy hasn't been cascaded down to absolutely every level. What, what concretely and measurably could be the impact of this? And I think, again, what we need to have if we have internal auditors working in the corporate governance space is not a you didn't tick the box approach. But if you do say you didn't tick, tick the box, you say, you know, you didn't seem to have a risk evaluation for this decision. And I'm now worried because we're starting to get into difficulty uh, in relation to the decision that was made by the board, whether you urgently need to do the uh, uh, risk assessment of what happened. And so the, the doing the governance bit has a positive consequence and benefit and an impact that will be meaningful. This is always an important thing for auditors. Can you join up the dots? And then the final thing I want to say is that any time you're auditing uh, a difficult area, and as Martin said at the very beginning, this is starting to become much more advanced auditing to start to get the auditors to look at corporate governance, you must recognize an intrinsically political dimension to what's going on. You know, forgive me, but sometimes some board members aren't so keen on their chief executive or another senior executive uh, and, and vice versa. And you can effectively have agendas playing out. And what is vital when you're going into this space of looking at corporate governance is that you have your political antenna fully activated. Um, because if not, you could get yourself into quite a lot of deep water quickly and, and you have to have a situation where you play smart so that you build respect and then you'll get the chance to be asked back to look at something else next year. Otherwise, you know, you'll have this crash and burn situation where you have a go at something and everybody goes internal audit were completely naive. And then, uh, well, thank you. You looked at corporate governance two years ago. We won't have you looking at again for the next three years. And that's not what you want. Yeah. Martin. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. And as you're talking again, some things prompted prompt me really. The first thing is the importance of focusing on governance risk. And I think when we look at risk, governance is unique. So if we think governance risk, a lot of things that James Martin talking about today in this session, have been looking at different areas. So focusing on governance risk is most important. The second thing really is I believe this area, a bit like sort of looking at different areas of IT, you're peeling off the level of the onion. So year one, you'll do the easy bits, the, the procedure, the policy setting. Year two, you do something. So each, each time you do an audit, you're peeling off a different layer of the onion. So 
In other, in other words, just emphasizing what Jane said, don't say we're doing a complete governance audit this year, but we're gonna do the first bit this year, year two, we're dropping down. And um, the next thing, which I often found is very interesting, is you don't do an audit year one at all, you do a survey. And if it's the first time you've ever looked at government, so what we're gonna do is do a bit of fact finding this year. We're gonna look at what's involved. And this, the aim of this survey is to come up with a methodology and an audit plan for next year, which then gets us round of actually jumping into something which is just too difficult and not coming up with enough meaty stuff. So doing this idea of doing a survey, doing the search, without maybe an audit report, but you're ending up with a, a plan for the future, I think it's a great way to tackle this. And the other thing that James and I discussed about earlier is before you audit something like governance in the company, maybe it's worth auditing what governance is like in your own internal audit department. And I think that's a really interesting way of approaching it because you'll also identify which are the politically too difficult bits to cover. Because if you're talking to the head of audit, about how he or she runs things, how he or she makes decisions, communicates, etc. You can assess internally the sensitivity of handling some of these things. So doing an internal audit, audit of governance to start off with, I think is a great way of fact finding. And also it's um it leads you in an idea of what could be a problem when you're looking at the organization. So that's probably all I'd add to this slide, I think, James. So um, you've, you've made a couple of brilliant points. I think your recommendation to auditors to, you know, before you start auditing the organisation on its governance, ask yourself the question about the governance of the internal audit team itself, I think is a brilliant point. And I would say the same thing applies to, you know, the risk management of the internal audit department. Uh, or indeed the culture of the internal audit department. You know, before you start thinking you can audit culture, that's a different topic, you know, make sure you understand the culture of the internal audit. So I love the way that you've brought that back onto looking at ourselves first. I think that's going to be a really important theme for future internal auditors is let's look at me before I start being clever about other people. Oh, I agree. Also, you've and, and I'm so glad this is why Martin and I love having conversations because this is genuinely although we've had, the, had a little bit of a chat we always get new things and important things coming out two two heads are better than one which is what corporate governance is about this issue of what you should do in year one and Martin's idea about you know consider doing a survey I think highlights and it's touched upon but Martin's really gone for the issue of you must consider what is the current assurance framework over corporate governance. We talked about speaking to the uh, company secretary. There may even be external or, or, um, lawyers involved in this. So the idea of let's survey what's going on to get an idea of where the assurance in corporate governance is strong or maybe where the assurance in corporate governance is less strong. And then that leads to, so don't just dive into doing the audit. And the other thing that Martin said, which again, I just want to stress because it's so important in terms of auditors getting their head around this, is ask yourself the question, do I really need to do an audit right now on this? Or do I need to do a high level review of this particular area? Or, for example, should I give them some advice on this topic uh, based on what good practices or more mature things? So I think Martin's analogy of don't just jump in is really, really well made and really important for internal auditors. Martin, any uh, other or final reflections? No, I think, I think I'm fine, really. I, I mean, all we're going to touch really is the impact maybe on the, the pandemic on on governance, and I think it's just demonstrated how governance really needs to be even more slick during challenging times. And um, particularly, we, we've talked before, I think, James, about um, the role of internal audit during the pandemic as well. And um, I think you're telling me about lots of internal audit departments are now providing greater support to the, um, the, the second level, if you like. So I think that is maybe changing things. What we're not sure at this stage is what impact this will affect audits in the future, really. And maybe 
you know, if we're talking about this and maybe in 2022, we'll, we'll have some fresh ideas on how audit has added even greater value during this global, um, these global issues, really. And that's the only thing I'd like to add is maybe the role of audit will, will change and particularly the way we look at governance, I think might be even, even better than we currently do. So that's my only final thought, really. You, you've, I think the issue that you've raised, you know, bringing up COVID is brilliant, is it raises this issue about what I would call the shelf life of our assurances, right? Yeah. You can imagine doing a corporate governance audit at the beginning of 2020 and saying internal audit believes corporate governance is marvellous, right? Yeah. Similarly, you can imagine internal audit doing a, a, a review of the organisation's culture Internal audit believes the, the governance of uh, the, the, the culture of this organization is marvelous and it's on an improving trend. I hear that sometimes. You know, what Martin's highlighting is that, you know, things can change even with corporate governance, literally within the space of a month. You can have a new CEO, you can have a, a new board member, or whatever. So I think a plea to all internal auditors who are listening to this is be careful about assuming that, you know, governance seems to be steadily improving when all of a sudden the company has a cost cutting program or a reorganization and half the governance which had been put in place is in suspense while the reorganization takes place. So um, well made. And, and Martin, yes, I would love to be doing these things with you uh, in future. It's been a, a real pleasure. This is who we are. We thought we'd just put this at the end of the presentation and you can get in touch with either of us uh, via my Risk AI website. And there's some other videos that Martin and I have done uh, in the link at the bottom. Martin, what an absolute pleasure as always. Nice to see you, James. Take care. All the best. Bye bye.